What I'm going to talk about this morning, or I guess this afternoon, although it's morning for me, is some of the work we've been doing in cardiomyopathies. And I'm going to tell you about some of the research we did a couple of years ago, and now how we're starting to look at this technique called exome sequencing. And I'm going to assume that some of you know a lot about cardiology and hearts, and some of you know a little bit. I'm going to assume that some of you know a lot about exome sequencing, because I know you're doing that here, but some of you perhaps don't. So I'll kind of cover some of the background basics as well as I give my talk. And I'm going to describe what disease that we're studying in humans. Um, I'll talk about this technique of exome sequencing and how it works and what it exactly is. And then at the end, I'll show you some examples of some families that we're studying. And if you have any questions along the way, it's a small group, please just interrupt me. I'm happy to try to answer them. So the diseases that we study are these diseases called cardiomyopathies. Cardio referring to heart and mus myo for muscle and pathies for diseases. So very simply, these are heart muscle diseases. And there are many things that can cause heart disease. So if you want to drink a tremendous amount of alcohol or you get exposed to certain viruses, uh, those can cause heart disease. We're interested mainly, mainly in those cases that are genetic so that there'll be a father and a mother and then they'll have a child or several children who have the heart disease. And these genetic forms happen to occur in younger individuals. So many times when you think of heart disease, you're thinking of someone in their 50s, 60s, or 70s. These will actually happen to individuals in their 20s or 30s. So those of you in the room, young people in the room, could have cardiomyopathy even as a 25 or 30-year-old because of the genetic defects that lead to these problems. How do the patients feel? Well, they have their heart beats too fast or too slow. Sometimes they have heart failure, so they feel that they're very short of breath and they have low energy. And then because this happens to young individuals, sometimes they actually need cardiac transplants. And so if you're a young person getting a cardiac transplant, these genetic diseases are probably the cause of that. And we've been interested in the genetics. Um, there are several different types of cardiomyopathies, so a little bit like your Italian gelato, they come in different flavors. And so I don't expect you to know all the different flavors, but sometimes the heart here, which is normal, you can see the heart wall gets thicker, so this sort of thickness from here to here gets thicker. Sometimes this chamber here where the blood's supposed to be gets larger, so we call this a hypertrophic or thickened cardiomyopathy. This is a dilated or enlarged heart, and there are other flavors as well, and not surprisingly, different flavors of these heart disease have been caused by different genetic factors, and so we've been spending the last 15 years trying to figure out what are the genetic causes for the different flavors of cardiomyopathy. And this is kind of what's happened. And so I don't know if any, how many of you are actually doctors that see patients or if you're mostly in the research realm, but because of the research successes, we've moved to what we'll get to at the end, this idea of using exome sequencing to look at our patients. But as a, as a doctor, when I look at a patient with a genetic disease, I sometimes think of the patient as a little bit like a haystack. And have you heard the expression, a needle in a haystack? Okay, that's not just an American expression, good. So the idea is that this is your patient and this is all their genetic material and somewhere in that genetic material is a genetic defect or a mutation or the needle in the haystack that explains why that patient has disease. And so where we've been with clinical genetics is about 15 or 20 years ago, we could tell the patient, I'm looking at you on the outside, I think I know what's going on but I can't look at any of the DNA. So I think I know what your diagnosis is but I can't tell. And then about 10 years ago, we started to be able to look inside the haystack at some of the genes, and we could find a genetic defect and say, oh, now I can look at the patient and I can find the genetic defect. I know what's going on. And as we had more and more genes, so not one gene, but several genes in a panel, we could know even more. And where we are today, uh, I have only just met a few of you, and we've already started to talk about how there are problems with this exome sequencing, that we get so much information about the haystack we get a little bit overwhelmed, and I'll show you some of that towards the end. So where we are with our diseases right now, if we take an individual who has hypertrophic disease, about half the time we know what the gene is or we can find the gene, and the other half of the time we really can't. So we think that these patients have a genetic problem. They have a needle in the haystack, but we can only find it about half the time. And that's true in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where at the moment, within hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there are two genes that are fairly prominent, this gene and this gene, which means if you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there's about a 50% chance I can find your gene, and if I find the gene, it's probably gonna be one of these two genes up here. 
The other disease, and the one I'll talk about most today, is the dilated form. That's where that heart is gradually enlarging. And until fairly recently, we knew about 40% of the time, 35% of the time, we would know this patient has a dilated heart disease. We do our genetic panel, and we can find the needle in the haystack. And for dilated disease, it wasn't that there were two major genes. There was sort of three genes that were fairly prominent, and then a whole bunch of others that were causing the disease. And if we break this out a little bit more, we can look that for dilated hypertrophic disease, when you look at the known genes, these are all the known genes, the two big ones and a whole bunch of other little ones that are much less frequent. For dilated disease, unfortunately, it was a big, bit more of a mess. So these are all the known genes. Here are the three that were the most common. But look at all these others in here. This creates a problem because when we're trying to take a patient and find the needle in the haystack, for the dilated patients, we have to look at a lot of genes, a lot of possibilities. And if we're trying to understand what causes a disease, well, this disease has one, two major causes. Unfortunately, this disease has one, two, three, you know, 20 or so different causes. It's much more complicated. So if you wanted to try to be the smart researcher in the lab and make a cure for this disease, probably you'd want to start with this one because if you cured this gene defect, that would be a big deal. If you cured you know, this little gene defect right here, but it didn't help the other gene defects, it's a bigger problem. So the dilated disease seems to be a lot more uh, complicated than the hypertrophic disease. So before we get to exome sequencing, we did this project about four years ago looking at a very big gene called Titan. And our question was, if you look at this gene called Titan, which I'll tell you about in a moment, how often is Titan the cause of the disease in the patient? So let me tell you a bit about Titan. So this is not Everest. This is K2, which is the second biggest mountain on the world, in the planet. And Titan is not the biggest gene, but it's the second biggest gene. So it's a very large uh, gene to look at. It has 368 exons, and it actually encodes the largest protein uh, in mammals. And it's actually the third or fourth most abundant protein in the heart. So it's a very important protein in the sarcomere of the heart. And it actually spans a large portion of the sarcomere. And so those of you that look at genes know that if someone gives you a project and it has five exons, that's an easy project to do. 20 exons, OK, they, they, they must think you're pretty good. But 360 exons is a lot to look at, especially if you're going to look at it not just in one patient, but in dozens of patients. And so up until four or five years ago, it was very expensive to look at genes this big until some new technology came along. I imagine that many of you are familiar with the sarcomeres inside of muscles. And so this is an electron micrograph inside a, a muscle. This could be a cardiac muscle here. And you've got the Z disks on either side. And this is the actual apparatus that contracts and causes the force in our heart when we uh, contract our heart. And here in blue, from one side all the way to the middle, and then from the middle all the way back to the other side, is this giant protein called Titan. And it has a very uh, important function, but one that hasn't been well understood because it's so large and difficult to study. But if you can imagine every time you contract your heart, what happens is this piece and this piece come together as your heart squeezes, and then they relax when they go apart. And most of the contraction occurs between the actin and myosin interface here, but the titan you can think of as a spring. And so essentially when the heart contracts, you're loading the spring that's tightened and the the muscle relaxes, and the titan helps the muscle spring back. And that's important because if we all tightened our muscles but couldn't relax them, then you'd have a real problem. So this is a very important protein in the heart. It just happens to be a very big one. And here's another picture of it uh, shown just uh, now half of it here going to the middle of the sarcomere. So here's titan, one side all the way along here with several different domains and really stretches from one side of the sarcomere to the other. And again, because it was such a big protein, it was difficult to study until we were able to do high throughput sequencing. And we did that in this paper that was published just last year. And I'll just walk you through the things that we did. So in this particular study, we looked at patients. And we looked at patients with the enlarged dilated heart. And we actually had three different populations. There was a population that was mostly uh, a genetic form. These are individuals who were young, like those of you in this room, and had a dilated cardiomyopathy. And many of them had family members who had dilated cardiomyopathy as well. 
We had another population that was a little bit different. Most of these individuals here um, had had uh, some transplants occur as well, but they, uh, not as many of them had a family history, but they were more likely to have had a transplant. And then this is the population that's partly from Denver, Colorado, and about half of it was from uh, Italy, many of the patients actually from locally here in Trieste as well. So we combined these three different populations and asked the question, what sort of Titan mutations do they have? What's the needle in the haystack when we look at Titan? And we used a couple different methods. We used traditional DNA sequencing that many of you have probably used the last several years. And then the more recent families, we use next generation sequencing. And there were a few differences depending on the technique that we used. These are the results that we had. So we started with 312 patients. And by using the different sequencing platforms, we found about 360 different uh, mutations. Uh, some of them uh, were in different categories here. And I won't tell you what we did with all these mutations. We're mostly focusing on the truncation variants. These are the mutations that were predicted to stop the protein from being produced in its normal length. So either the protein would be a shortened protein or potentially wouldn't be stable and would be degraded. And we decided to study those first because they're the more dramatic mutations predicted to have a bigger effect on the protein structure itself. And so of those 312 families, uh, 67 had the truncating mutations and they were in different versions, either a nonsense frame shift or splicing mutation. And when we compared the patients who had dilated the enlarged hearts with another group of patients that had the thickened hearts, and then with individuals who were felt to be healthy, you can see if you just look at the blue bars here that there were quite a few mutations, you know, 20, over 20% 20 of those truncating mutations in the dilated hearts, but very few in the other categories. So this gave us good statistical evidence that a truncating mutation was highly correlated with having a dilated heart. Unfortunately, about 3% of controls had this as well. So we have a little bit of a problem that having a, dilate, a dilated heart doesn't automatically tell you, well, a truncation will do that always, because these individuals here who were healthy at the time also had this mutation. So 3%, so maybe one of you in the room has a Titan truncating mutation but doesn't yet have heart failure. And we don't know if these individuals will actually get heart failure. So we have a little bit of a problem that these mutations are found in controls as well. They weren't found in the thickened form of heart disease, um, but it really looked like you know, some controls are gonna be walking around with these mutations and we don't quite know what that means. Are they at risk for heart failure or are they somehow protected? These are some of the families that we studied. So we used a different technique here called linkage analysis to look at some of the families and without going into the details, found a very high linkage score, if you will, or a LOD score, really suggesting that individuals who had this particular type of mutation, it really correlated very highly with them having the cardiomyopathy. When we looked at the patients with the thickened form of cardiomyopathy, the hypertrophic patients, about 1% of them had truncations, but these three individuals that we found also had mutations in other cardiomyopathy genes, and so we're actually suspicious that these truncating mutations were not having much of an effect in these patients. It was the second or third gene mutation they had that was really causing their disease. But once again, we're troubled a little bit by the fact that having that mutation was also, you could also find that mutation in controls, and so if someone says, oh, this patient has a truncating mutation, you can't always assume that they're gonna have cardiomyopathy as well, because it does show up in a few controls. We tried to ask the question of whether the uh, protein is produced or not. And if these mutations uh, led to a protein that was absent and the protein didn't occur at all because the truncating mutation made the RNA unstable and the RNA broke down, you'd sort of expect that these truncating mutations shown here in red or blue would be fairly randomly distributed. So if the mutations always caused the RNA to be unstable and there was no RNA produced and you had no protein produced, there's no reason that the location of these mutations would cluster. But they do actually cluster in certain parts of the protein. So we actually think that probably these stop codons um, lead to a protein that's produced and you get a protein that is shortened, perhaps to here or perhaps to here. So you now have normal Titan protein here in this sort of yellow-orange color, 
but probably these patients also have some shortened titan as well that can't reach all the way across to the middle here. So we think probably these patients are producing a normal form of titan from their normal allele and then a shortened form on the mutant allele. We tried to look a little bit as to whether these mutations were predictive of how patients survived. You know, how old were they when they got diagnosed? Did they need transplants? What age did they die? And really we didn't find any particular differences as we looked at the clinical features of the patients other than the fact that, and this is actually a typographical error here, so this should say 48 years for women. So the one thing we did find was that men happened to have the disease a little bit earlier and a little bit more severely than women. So if you looked at the time that the patient had a heart transplant, uh, had to get some sort of uh, device placed to help their heart, or when they died, um, that seemed to happen sooner for men with the titan truncating mutations than, uh, than the women. We also looked a little bit at the population. So anytime you do these human studies, you have the problem that we don't select our humans the way we would like. So those of you that work with cell lines or with mice, you have a lot more control over your mice than we do over our patients. So you can always manipulate the mice and make them do most of what you want. Um, but patients, we can't do that to for obvious ethical reasons. So the populations were quite different. Um, our, our population from Italy and Denver is here in this green color, and these are the other two populations that were studied, and we found different mutation rates in those populations. So our population had a fairly low rate of truncating mutations. These other populations had a higher rate. You may recall that these used next generation DNA sequencing, and this used traditional sequencing. So it may be that the next generation sequencing has a, a different sensitivity than what we did with traditional Sanger sequencing. So maybe we missed some mutations in this group. Um, maybe we found too many in this by accident, although these were all reconfirmed by Sanger sequencing. So it's probable that if this population had a lower rate, it may be because we missed a few mutations. So a couple interesting points, and then we'll get on to the exome sequencing. So if we looked at, um, these were the patients that we studied. Um, so we found, studied a total of 700 individuals overall. Um, we actually found you know, 950 uh, mutations that were quite rare, less than 1%, and were classified as having some effect on the protein. So we've talked about the truncating mutations, but a lot of these mutations just change the amino acid sequence, which when you do the math means that there was more than one variant per person. So a lot of times we think of, let's go look at someone's gene and find the mutation. Well, it turns out that if we looked at your Titan today, you would all have one to two mutations in Titan that are not in the published wild type sequence. And so we all have a Titan mutation, and that creates problems. You know, Titan is so big, there's lots of room for mutations to occur. It makes it very hard to interpret mutations in Titan because anytime you look, you will find something, and then you have to figure out, did you find a real disease-causing mutation, or did you find something that is uh, just there by chance and is not causing disease? And here's an example of that. This was a paper that was published about eight or nine years ago where they found a mutation in Titan and decided that this mutation was probably causing disease. Later on, they were able to go back and figure out that this person with disease had the Titan mutation but got it from her father, who actually ended up probably being healthy. And it turns out that this family is now found to have a Titan truncating mutation. And so probably this mutation coming from the mother to the child is probably the more severe form of the mutation. And this was one that 10 years ago they assumed was the mutation and they just got it wrong. So sometimes when we do our genetic testing and we find these types of mutations that aren't as damaging as these truncating ones, we might overcall that and suggest that this is causing the disease and later on you find out perhaps it's not. So anytime you do this type of sequencing, you look at big genes or lots of genes, you run into problems that you're gonna find things that are, you may overinterpret or underinterpret. So from our Titan standpoint, looking at the big needle in the haystack, one of the biggest genes, of course, we were able to conclude that about 20% of our dilated disease is probably due to these truncating mutations in Titan. Um, we don't think that these cause the hypertrophic form of cardiac disease, but we have to acknowledge that 3% of healthy individuals carry a Titan truncating mutation, and we don't quite know what that means. Um, there was a little earlier onset in men, 
and the conduction disease in the heart, for those of you who are clinicians, was fairly uncommon. So these were fairly pure dilated cardiomyopathy. And what we're working on right now is all the other types of mutations, these missense mutations that essentially cause the protein to have a difference in the sequence, but don't truncate or shorten the protein. And we're trying to figure out whether any of these or how many of these might cause disease and how many of these might actually just be benign changes. And that becomes fairly different or difficult to do because as I told you, everybody has a Titan mutation. And so how can I look at a particular mutation and figure out that that one's causing disease and another one is not causing disease? And because we know that uh, the Titan protein is uh, produced, there's a normal copy and then there'll be a damaged copy, we're starting to talk about are there ways that if you increase the normal amount of Titan that was produced, you could rescue the cells, rescue the heart, rescue the patient as a way of treating this disease. So as we go back and look at our numbers, we can see that from last year, we were able to fill in a fairly big chunk of the dilated disease by the addition of Titan. So now this is really the major gene in dilated cardiomyopathy. And it's somewhat shifted the field because previously, if you remember, there were so many genes, you didn't really know which one to focus on. There's now a lot of attention focused on Titan because this is now the major gene potentially for dilated cardiomyopathy. So as people are starting to think about ways of treating it, Titan becomes a very attractive target because it accounts for 20 to 25 percent of the disease. Okay, so that brings us up to exome sequencing. So I'll spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about what that is and then how we've used it in a couple instances. Um, does everybody know what exome sequencing is? Or raise your hand if you, the brave people, if you know what exome sequencing is, raise your hand. So most of you haven't done exome sequencing or aren't brave, but Italians are brave. So I'll assume that you're all very brave, but you don't know very much about exome sequencing. So I'll tell you just a little bit about what that looks like. Um, so this is the simple way I think about it. You just put your head in the haystack. And instead of looking at one gene or two genes, you look at all the genes simultaneously. But you can imagine this isn't very comfortable to stick your head in the haystack, so there are some problems with it. And I'll tell you some of those as well. So most of you have probably done regular PCR and regular sequencing. Is that fair? Regular PCR? Okay, so regular PCR, the traditional PCR, if you remind yourself of it, you say, I want to do some PCR. You decide of what, so you pick your genes, identify some targets, you amplify that target, usually one target at a time. Once that target has been amplified, you can then sequence it. And essentially, although there are some variations of this, you take one target and you do one reaction and then you sequence. So if this is our gene here and we want to look at this exon, we do our PCR, we make lots of copies of it, and then we sequence it and we read it. If we have to do the whole gene, we can do the same thing again for the whole gene. But in general, you're going to do these steps separately and do your sequences separately, because if you start to mix this sample and this sample together and sequence them together, you've sort of got two sequences overlapping each other, and it's very hard to look at. And in exome sequencing, we take a very different approach. Instead of doing each piece one at a time, you can actually do a lot of it simultaneously. So for exome sequencing, you say, OK, Let's look at some of the genes, or maybe all of the genes I'm interested in. You find some way of getting those genes ready in a test tube, and then you just sequence the whole thing. And so you can take many targets and put them in one reaction. So if you're interested in this one gene, you can take all this gene and put it into one test tube and sequence it all at once. And even though you're sequencing this at the same time as you're sequencing these other pieces, you can end up separating them when you're done and figuring out which is which. So that looks a little bit like this. Um, if you imagine that this is the gene with its different exons, and you can actually really imagine that this isn't just one gene with its exons. This is all the genes, all 20, 22,000 genes, with all the exons from all the genes, everything. And we call that the exome. Exome is all of the exons of all the genes. And so if you want, you can take your patient's DNA or your mouse DNA if you want. You can agitate it and break it up into small pieces. And you see that this gene here is broken into small pieces. This piece broke perfectly right along the exon. This piece broke along the exon with a little bit of the intron next to it. This bit's half and half. You just break it up randomly. 
And you do that for your whole gene. And really, you do it for your whole exon, for all the genes this has happened. And as you can imagine, most of what you get is actually not the stuff you're interested in. So remember, only about 1% or 2% of all the DNA has genes in it. So most of what you get is the stuff in between the genes that you don't really want to look at with this technology at the moment. So you have to do something to get rid of the stuff you're not interested in and hang on to the stuff you're interested in. So you buy a kit called an exome capture kit. And these kits have sequences that you're interested in with little tags on them. You can then mix them in with this sample up here. And you'll then be able to pull down or separate the pieces you're interested in from all the stuff that you don't care about. So you end up, these will capture the material from up here. But they won't capture this stuff that doesn't have the exons in it. So when you're done, you've taken your DNA, you've broken it into little pieces. Most of it is the stuff you're not interested in. When you've done this step, now you have mostly the things that you're interested in. And the new sequencing technology, it doesn't work the same way as PCR. You just take all of this, this huge mixture, and you just put it in your machine, and you come back a couple days later, and it gives you your results. So all of this gets sequenced really in one or two or three reactions. So you don't have to do 20,000 different PCR reactions. It's essentially one reaction. It gives you an awfully large amount of data. You have to talk to people who are very good with computers to separate the data and to tell you, you know, which piece of your sequence goes with which gene. And then you get to interpret the results. And the reason we've been able to do this is because of this slide. This is from 2001 to 2013. So this is the estimated cost it would take to sequence a human genome. And you can see back in 2001, you really couldn't do it because it was $100 million. Way you just, you know, no one could do that kind of experiment. And you can see around 2007, 2008, the new technology started to take off. And this cost has gotten cheaper and cheaper. And so now you can do an entire human genome for about seven or $8,000. And the exome sequence I just uh, told you about, you can do that for less than $1,000. So how many euros is that, Louisa? I don't, is that 600 euro? Yeah. Something like that. So it's still money, but it's a lot cheaper than what it was up here. And I actually believe that very soon this will become almost free. At some point, a, uh, a drug company or an insurance company will offer to sequence your genes for free so they can look at it and decide on your insurance or decide what drug you need. So it's getting cheaper and cheaper. OK, so we've talked about our disease. I've told you about the Titan gene. In the last few minutes, I'll tell you about how we're using exome sequencing to study some of these patients and these families. And so our strategy has been to take some of our big families. So this is a very large family. Actually was uh, ascertained here in Italy um, 20, 25 years ago, probably. And you can see the individuals colored here in black have the cardiomyopathy. And what we ended up doing was taking this individual and this individual and this individual and doing exome sequencing. And we've now done that on about 25 different families. Uh, we did this about a year and a half ago. And each sample that we uh, did cost about 3,000 euro, 4,000 euro per sample. So now it's down to 600. So in the space of about a year, year and a half, it's gone from 4,000, 3,000 euro down to 600. So it's dropping pretty fast. And we asked the question, let's look at all the mutations in, on all of the genes for these individuals and try to figure out what mutation does this person have that this person has and this person has as well. Because they're all part of the same family. They all have the same disease. They should have the same mutation, the same needle in the haystack. Um, the nice thing is that they're not closely related. So if I look at this individual here and his brother, they're so closely related, they share a lot of their genetics. But if I look at this individual here, who's related through his mother, who's then related through her sister, so this is sort of a cousin, then this is a little bit, uh, you know, cousins don't share as much genetic material, so they're a little bit better to study. So this is what we look like, what it looks like, and this is what the data look like. And if you want, you can look down these columns. These are the three individuals. And these are just the averages of those individuals. So when you do this kind of sequencing, um, when you start, you get the sequence. You ask your computer people to take the sequence and compare it to the normal human genome and tell you what you found. And you start out by finding about 270,000 different mutations. 
So this is situations where the bioinformatics person hands you a file and says, good news, you found 270,000 things to look at, okay, which is a real problem, and, and you can't even give that to a PhD student to look at. It would take them a lifetime. So you have a problem. So we then have to use some informatics filtering. What we decided to do was to say, well, of these mutations, these variants, um, how many of them affect the protein? So they stop the protein or they change the protein sequence or they change splicing. And that gives you down to now about 12,000. And then we looked at those mutations that were in very conserved regions. Um, we looked at those that had not been reported before, were felt to be damaging. If they were in a duplicated area that were harder to evaluate, we excluded those. Um, and used some other software to predict if the mutation here, so this mutation, was it novel, meaning it hadn't been seen in the general population, and was it damaging? And you get down to more reasonable numbers. But even still, 136 mutations to look at is a lot. And if your plan at some point was to study that in a cell model or in a mouse model, do you really want to be the person who has to make 136 transgenic mice? You probably don't. So we were then able to ask the question, well, remember if we go back to the family, they were fairly distantly affected individuals. Let's see which mutations were shared by two individuals. On an average, there were 21 of these shared or by all three individuals. And it turned out that when we were done from that big family, we went from 275,000 possibilities down to eight through this filtering process. And it actually turned out that of these eight, two of these were probably not very good reads by the sequencer, so actually there were only six to look at. And there were these six. So instead of having to look at 200,000, we really had to look at six highly likely, the most likely genes to look at, and we were then able to look not just at the three individuals we'd originally studied at 3,000 euros each. We could then look at these genes individually in all the people in the family. And it turned out that only this gene here, this troponin gene, was the one that everybody who was sick had the mutation. So everybody who's got a green circle around them here, we were able to test and prove that they had the mutation. And that didn't hold true for the other genes. So we had very good evidence in this big family that this particular mutation was shared by all the people who were sick uh, and none of the people who were healthy. And interestingly, it turned out that we uh, found this same mutation in another family, also from uh, part of northern Italy. So this is a second family here that has the same mutation as well. And we actually were able to find out that this mutation in this family even though it's exactly the same mutation, same gene, exactly the same change, um, probably occurred separately in this family. So we thought perhaps these two families being from northern Italy were related to each other, but in studying the haplotypes around that area, it looks like that this family probably had the mutation sometime by itself, and this was a second event. So these families live in the same area, but they don't appear to be related through this mutation. And I'll show you one other family that we're working on right now. So this is another family. We've got individuals with the disease here in colored and in gray. And we did exome sequencing again. We sequenced this individual, and I think it was this one and this one. And using the same sort of analysis, finding hundreds of thousands of variants, same sort of filters, we were able to find a mutation that's present in all the individuals who were sick and in almost none of the people who were healthy, except for this woman here. And this woman here actually had always been borderline. She'd always had a slightly abnormal ultrasound of her heart. We had her heart looked at again, and then we showed the heart studies to three expert cardiologists and didn't give them any other information. And they all agreed that her heart disease is abnormal, her heart is abnormal, so she probably has the disease as well. She's just developing it while we watch. So she's in her, I think she's in her 30s, and so she has the mutation and is probably going to have more problems as she gets a little bit older. And so once we find the mutation, we start to try to figure out what the mutation consequence is. This mutation is in a gene called BAG3. It's actually a deletion in the gene inside the exon. So it shifts the protein frame and actually results in a shortened protein. So the protein is about 140 amino acids shorter than it should be. Um, you can see here, this is a normal person's heart, and this doesn't really project, but there's a very faint band here for BAG3. And so this individual 
on the western blot, um, produces some BAG3 very faintly, um, but doesn't produce a normal amount. In fact, what's interesting is that this protein, or this particular gene, the patient has two copies of it, a normal copy and a damaged copy. So really, you'd like to see that they had half the amount of the normal BAG3, where they've actually got less than half here. And I'll show you that why in just a moment. And as we look at the electron microscope pictures, this is from the, one of the individual's hearts. We're still trying to figure out what the heart, you know, what the changes are. We've noticed that there's more of this, these black dots here. There may be more glycogen in the heart than there should be. And so this heart may actually have a problem processing glycogen because of the low amounts of BAG3. One more bit of data from this family, and then we've just got a couple slides at the end. So this is now looking at patients with a normal heart and patients with heart failure. None of these actually have that BAG3 mutation I just showed you. So they don't have a BAG3 mutation, but the heart failure hearts all have lower amounts of BAG3. So we actually suspect that if you have heart failure, you have low amounts of BAG3. We don't know if that's a cause of heart failure or just a consequence of heart failure. And our patient probably had an even lower amount here because they were missing one of their BAG3 genes. So we're actually wondering whether BAG3 low amounts could be a generalized mechanism for heart failure. Do I, do I have, I have till, till four, right? Okay. So just a couple of the last things that we're doing. So it's not just about finding genes. That's interesting, but we're trying to figure out how can we find genes to help patients. And so we have some data that individuals who have mutations in certain genes, these are genes in the area we would call the sarcomere, they have a different prognosis than individuals who don't. So this is looking at uh, survival here. So everybody is surviving when they're born at zero, but over time, people start to die. And if you've got a sarcomere mutation, that's happening quicker than the individuals who don't have the sarcomere mutation. And we've looked at some of the other features in our data as well, and we've been able to show that for sarcomere mutations, perhaps a worse prognosis. So if you have dilated cardiomyopathy due to a sarcomere mutation, that may be worse than if you've got a mutation in some of the other parts of the gene. Um, we've identified that individuals with Lamin mutations have a more severe problem. And I just told you about the Titan truncations. <clears throat> Didn't really seem to affect prognosis very much, but was more of a problem for men than it was for women. And one of the last things we're doing now, <clears throat> which is uh, fairly exciting, is now trying to figure out if there are ways that we can treat patients. So this is a study that we're doing in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and it's called the VANISH trial. All cardiology studies have to have a fancy name associated with them. That's just the way cardiologists are. They just, they just like the fancy names. Um, and so this is the VANISH trial. Uh, bless you. Um, and what we're doing in this trial is we're taking individuals who have uh, a history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in their family. And they've got a mutation, so their genes are positive. They have a positive mutation. Some of them actually have disease already, so they've already gotten thickening of their hearts. We call those the phenotype positive. So genotype positive, phenotype positive means you've got a mutation and you're already developing the disease. And we've got another group of patients whose genetics are positive, but their phenotype is negative. They've not yet developed the disease, and we predict they're going to in the next few years. So we're now going to take these individuals knowing their genetics, and give them a particular medication and see if we can, at two years, uh, take these individuals who have the mutation and are supposed to get the disease and prevent them from getting it, and these individuals here who have the mutation and already have early disease and prevent them from getting worse. So most of the time when you go to the cardiologist, you go to the heart doctor, <clears throat> they don't look at your genetics at all. They just say, you have heart failure, how do you feel, and they give you some medicines. And they almost always give you the same medicine. So it's, in, in my view, it's not the very, a very clever way of doing uh, medicine. That's how we do a lot of medicine, which is not very informed. We say, this is the problem. Everybody gets the same treatment. In this particular study, only those individuals with certain mutations are going to get the drug. And we're going to see if, by treating the genotype, we can make people better than just treating everybody the same. And so I'm going to close with what's happening to our patients. And so this is a patient who contacted me just a couple weeks ago. And he was interested in getting his whole genome sequenced. And so I don't know if you're aware of this, but you can do that now if you want. And you don't have to go see a doctor to do that. Um, sometimes people contact me, and, and they're, 
they're a little bit crazy or they've read a story and they misunderstood it, they're not well informed. This gentleman was actually fairly well informed. So he's thinking of spending about 4,000 euro of his own money to get his genome sequenced um, by attending this symposium in November. And he was calling me because he needed a doctor to sign something that said that he, he knew what he was doing and he could go ahead and do that. And so if you want, you don't have to go see a doctor to get your genome sequenced. You can spend three or 4,000 euro. Pretty soon it'll be, you know, 100 euro. And you could get all your genome sequenced. This is a nice conference that's happening in San Diego. And he's going to fly to San Diego. It's nice. It's near the beach. And he'll get his sequences. This was his reason. Uh, he thinks it's a good idea because uh, he wants to understand his molecular blueprint and ultimately improve his health. And he thinks that unlocking the genome for all of us is a wise investment in long-term wellness. So this gentleman thinks that by getting his genome, he's going to learn about all the diseases he might be at risk for. And he's going to potentially change his lifestyle or take medicines to prevent some of those diseases. And if you're interested, you can go to the uh, Illumina website here and learn more about this. And it's 5,000 US dollars to do this. You've already missed your opportunity this time, but they're going to do this again and again. And uh, something, to, something to certainly think about. Uh, they also give you a free iPad. It's not free. You've paid for it, but you get an iPad with your genome as well. Uh, so this is uh, the research team, at least in the US. I haven't included the research team all around the rest of the world. And certainly, a lot of the folks here in, in Trieste have done a lot of this work and helped us out with a lot of it. Um, but I managed to keep on time. Uh, this is Colorado also, if you want to come and visit. One of the things we like to do is climb these uh, mountains. They're 14,000 feet tall, so I, I don't know how many meters that is. I, I always mean to 3,500 meters, 4,000 meters. They're tall, um, and there are 50 of them in Colorado. And if you want, you can come and climb all 50 of them. It takes you about six weeks to do it if you're really good. Um, I've done three. This is, this is my third. Um, so I thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them.